This is Keeping the Faith on the Mormon Faircast. The Keeping the Faith series explores ways in which our faith can be challenged and ways in which we can overcome those challenges. Well, so this takes us into the point where you're coming back into the faith. Then. Right. So let's back up a second then and uh, talk about how it is you actually officially left the church. How did sure. that come about? So this, this was... Um, Shortly after I had come to self-identify as an atheist, um, and when I was you know, really disenchanted with Joseph Smith and using this model that I described of Joseph Smith as opportunist and try to understand the data, um, I, you know, I hadn't really even when I had stopped believing earlier. I really hadn't so much thought of leaving the church. I mean, it had occurred to me, but it wasn't something that I had wanted to do. Um, when I became an atheist, I really felt like there was no place in the church for me that, you know, like it really didn't matter if I still wanted to be part of the community in some way which I still was had kind of toyed with, you know, or considered. and um, So I guess sort of um, pretending like you were a believer and, you know, no. still kind of going through the, the motions or? N- well, no, not, not pretending like I was a believer. Um, I'd actually tried an experiment while I was... Um, I, I tried an experiment when I was an agnostic of going back to church and just like being sort of the word agnostic, right? Just being open about. So you you actually let people know that you didn't believe. Sure, I, I was in an I was in a new ward. Uh, I'd moved. It wasn't too long after I'd gone inactive. Really, it was several months later, I showed up at church one Sunday and. When they asked me to introduce myself in Sunday school and in priesthood, I told them that, uh, you know, I said, I'm Don Bradley, I'm new in your ward, I, you know, haven't, haven't been to church in a while, um, the last several years have been like one long crisis of faith for me, and I, I may not necessarily, you know, have a testimony of or believe the things that every you know that most of the other others here do, but you know I want to be here and be involved, and so I was. I, I didn't continue it very long, but um, you know going to church like that. But people were very accepting when I did. I think there, there's a difference. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when people are losing their faith, they're I think, unfortunately, they may be kind of shunned because um, people look at the direction that they're going, that they seem to be going, and they extrapolate from that that the person's on their way out of the church. And they don't want to get mixed up with that. They feel like that's a communicable disease, you know, and so if they really still have much to do with that person, then maybe they'll end up on the same road. Well, I wonder, too, if they just are scared and they don't know what to do we're often taught in the church too that you don't want to you don't want to place yourself in positions that can lead to a loss of faith for yourself. So you don't hang out in bars, you know. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right. Sure. And and so so maybe there's partly partly that that we're you know um, worried that somebody's ideas might you know uh, undermine our faith. Maybe partly you're worried that this person's involved in things that are unsavory and you don't want to be associated with that. And mm-hmm. that maybe it's simply a matter of um, we don't understand what this person's going through and it's hard to relate to and maybe mm-hmm. a little scary. And yeah. so it's, it's difficult to, um, to, to reach out to somebody like that. Yeah, yeah. I, when... but, but you didn't feel that? I mean, you talked about how you felt like that the people in your ward were fairly accepting. Well, they were quite accepting. And, but here's, here's what I was going to say. When people appear to be on their way out, members of the church get really nervous about them. When people are, like, coming back or when the direction appears to be mm. back into the church, 
people are extremely welcoming. And that's, okay, I see that's what you're something saying. that they saw you as, as somebody who was coming back rather than somebody who was leaving. Right, exactly. And so I think, you know, maybe if there are people listening to this who haven't been active for a while, you know, been out of the church, I, I really bet they would be very surprised if they if they went back to church and just, you know, let people know. I mean, not 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 raise questions like that are intended to like rattle people's faith or raise complex issues in Sunday school or something, but just you know, letting people know, hey, I've been through a long crisis of faith. I, you know, and I haven't been to church for a long time, but I would like to be here and participate. I think people would, members of the church would be very welcoming. Yeah, I think that's really true. I, and I think when people are leaving, I think so much of it is, um, well, you know how in polite company we're not supposed to talk about religion or politics. and mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that's because those are, you know, deeply held convictions that we have, they're almost, you know, part of our identity. And yeah. when somebody challenges those, it, it hmm. seems offensive and we're, yeah. we're sometimes hurt. Um, you know, and so it's, you know, you usually um, get along better in social situations if we avoid those types of things. Well, so when you're in church, you know, and, and somebody mm-hmm. is, or, or in your church community where somebody's signaling that, you know, these deeply felt uh, ideas that you have are wrong. You know, I mm-hmm. I, I think that you're, mm-hmm. you know, I, so that can feel like a slap in the face, yeah. and, and it's I think you know easy to become offended, um, and so maybe that's what some people sometimes sense as they're going through a faith crisis, and so it can be scary for somebody who is having these doubts and and you know is troubled by things to communicate that they are having these these concerns because of the way they can so often be received. They could be received as insults, you know, yeah. and, and felt that way. And so partly I think faithful members need to understand what's going on, you know, in you know, the, the minds and hearts of, of people who are struggling mm-hmm. so that they can uh, anticipate this type of reaction that, um, you know, they, un- they know what's going on for themselves and they understand uh, what somebody else may be going through. So yeah, yeah. As as an atheist, I really felt like there wasn't a place for me. Also, I felt like the things, even when I'd stopped going to church, I had thought that maybe I could publish things in Mormon history that would be useful, you know. Um, but as as things went on and my interpretations of Joseph Smith became more extreme, you know, more negative. Um, I didn't feel like what I had to offer would be a contribution, you know. Um, throwing acid at the foundations is not a not a contribution, you know. Um, and so I felt like there wasn't a place for me, and I felt like ultimately uh, the church wouldn't want me anyway because I was going to eventually, I planned on publishing my research and the, with the interpretations that I had at the time that would have meant, you know, portraying Joseph Smith in very negative light. And so, um, so I laughed. I, um, so this after this period where you're explaining how you were going to church to see if that would work? Yeah, and you know, I really enjoyed that when I went, and I don't know for sure why I stopped. Maybe it was, I, I don't i don't remember. Um, maybe it was just because I was becoming increasingly alienated. But in any event, after that point, you figured, I, I just need to make a clean break. Right. If, if someone wants to leave the church, it's really easy to find out how to do that. There are so many websites that are devoted to that, you know. Uh, there are websites that will give you, um, you know, a form letter or multiple form letters that you can adapt. Um, they'll give detailed instructions. They'll give a number of other people's experiences. Uh, you know, they'll talk about how to deal with a bishop or stake president who doesn't want you to leave and is 
trying to you know slow down that process. So they, they so give did you Greg the Greg Dodge, the guy who handles these requests in the membership department, they give his direct line number. You know, wow. It's like they, they lay it all out for you. So you did know? you start to get involved in these online communities of Mormon you know, dissidents? I, I, I did, actually. Um, Do you think I, that contributed to your um, movement out of the church, or, or were you pretty much just out by that time? Um, I was really internally, I, I was out, but um, it certainly couldn't have helped, you know. I mean, the... The communities that we get ourselves involved with help to shape our own self-identity. And I I got involved with ex-Mormon groups. There were some ex-Mormon social activities um, and, and a couple online groups. Um, I went, I think only twice, but I went during over a period of several years, but I went twice to the... Um, the Ex Mormon Conference they have, Ex Mormon Foundation has every year. Um, so, and I really, that's how I self identified at the time was as an ex Mormon. Um, so. So, did you use one of these form letters? I mean, what did you I do? I did, when... and I adapted it. I, I really I wanted it to not just be a general thing. I wanted to make sure I sort of said the right things, but um, I I felt like in the online instructions that they gave on this website, they, they say not to meet with your bishop or stake president. They'll, they say your bishop will want to meet with you. Do not meet with him. He will just try to talk you out of it. I felt like if I didn't meet with the bishop, I would be sort of like circumventing Part of the process, I felt like it would be sort of cowardly, you know, that I would be trying to get around meeting with the bishop just because it would be difficult, uh, and that wasn't a good enough reason, you know. And so, well, and you also wanted to feel like you, you know, had legitimate reasons and that you were, you know, authentic in your beliefs and that they couldn't really be challenged or overcome anyway. Is that is that true? Um. I don't know if that's part of what I was thinking in meeting with the bishop or not, but I but I know that I um, I definitely felt like that that I wanted to meet with the bishop. I didn't want to feel like I was trying to evade. You didn't you want know, to feel if, like you were hiding. If, from if the anything. church considered that to be part of the process, I wasn't going to try to evade it. I was okay. going to do it, and so I had I'd moved again, and um, I so it was a bishop that I didn't even know. Um, and I got my records transferred to that ward with the sole intention of then leaving the church. The church didn't know where, they didn't have my records there because they didn't know where I was. I got my records transferred there. Once they were there, I had my letter. I went and I met uh, with the bishop and I hand delivered the letter to him. Um, he read it. Um, he you know, was very concerned, tried to, he seemed really sad, you know, and um, he asked if I would meet with the stake president, which I said I would. Uh, it was, by the way, it was Pioneer Day, 2005. <laughs> <laughs> I, You're making your exes out of the church on Pioneer right, Day. Right, okay. exactly. Um, that wasn't entirely intentional, um, my records had just recently been transferred there, and I wanted to go ahead, and there was an appointment for that day. But I, I may have chosen between two different days, though, and chosen that one because that was the more symbolic day. Um, so I met with him, and um, he seemed to feel so bad that, you know, I um, I don't know. I didn't want him to feel any worse than he had to, but he, he, he asked if I'd meet with the stake president, who I said yes. It was a while before they kind of um, processed my letter and I got to meet with the stake president, but I did. And in my letter, I had I had known that the church authority or authorities that I met with were going to try to talk me out of what I was doing. So I wanted to make the letter say, I wanted to put things in it that would show them that it was useless. <laughs> 
to try to talk me out of it. Um, so I tried to be, for the most part, measured in what I said, but I gave like a, a sort of a laundry list of reasons for leaving, you know, and they were, I'm a good writer, and so it was, um, it was a pretty strongly, my points were communicated pretty strongly in the letter. What kinds of things were you listing in the letter? Well, um, I was listing, it was a range of things, so I listed, like, um, how the Book of Mormon, um, it, uses the King James uh, Bible um, pass, you know, the like when it quotes Isaiah and Matthew, it uses King James Bible passages. And, and it's been argued that it even includes like mistranslations that are in the King James and so on. And so I, I, I said that. Um, I also talked about Joseph Smith, uh, his so-called polyandrous marriages, marriages where he married someone who, polygamously who was legally married to someone else. Um, I made this argument that, um, I, I yeah, I gave a number of arguments. They weren't all historical or scriptural. Some of them were more um, kind of personal. I basically said that, like, when I was eight years old, I really hadn't been old enough to give informed consent to the things that I was going to be committing myself to for the rest of my life. Um, and um, let's see. I mean, it was, it was a number of things. Okay. Uh, they're, I mean, fairly typical things that we often hear. Uh, maybe, probably. Maybe, maybe yeah. packaged in a way that's a little more scholarly <laughs> and, you know, persuasive in its, in its pre- presentation. But um, how, how was that received? Um, so, like I said, the the bishop was very sad. I mean, he he wanted to help me. You know, you could tell. I could tell. But like, um, you know, I didn't really want to discuss all those sorts of things that he did. Um, like, I don't know. He was asking sort of testimony questions and so on. Um, I told him that I didn't believe in. I told him I was an atheist. Um, he was. He had hoped that I still believed in God and Christ at least, and could maybe attend some church. You know, um, when I met with the stake president, and he was very, very kind, um, and um, you know, it was the meeting was good, uh, and at the end. You know, so he was going to process my letter. He was going to send it on to church headquarters. And uh, at the end, one of the last things he said to me was that he had a feeling that I would be back. Well, I knew I wasn't going to be back, right? So, um, but just to humor him, I said, it's possible. Because I didn't want him to feel any worse than he had to, you know? Mm-hmm. Um so the the joke was on me, but um, I. Um, did, so did anybody make any attempt at that point to um, talk you out of it or, or say, well, sure, well, they, "No, wait a minute, these arguments are you know this, that's not true because of this"? Or yeah, they they tried some to talk me out of it. They didn't so much engage the specific arguments. Um, they kind of asked what my sources of information were and things like that. Um, so when they received this letter with all of these arguments, um, how do you think it would have been received by you if they or if they would have brought somebody else in to, um, I guess, try to intellectually explain the um, uh, other side of these types of arguments? Or, or had, you, had you explored those on your own already? Oh, I, I'd explored different angles on these topics. I mean, this wasn't... The decision that I made was wrong, and I, in retrospect, and it's a train wreck, you know, having left the church, one of the worst decisions that I've ever made in my entire life. But it was something that I'd thought through quite a bit at the time. And did, the, did, did you encounter any, or, or you know, explore 
Uh, I don't think fair existed at that time, but um, you know, farms certainly did, and you know, there there were. Uh, articles that farms had had to put out that addressed at least some of these issues that you're talking about. I think um, uh, certainly you had encountered those. Um, how did you how did you deal with that? Um, I felt like I had thought through and explored the issues more thoroughly than the people who were making the the other arguments and. Um, you know, I I had been wrestling with issues surrounding, let's say, Book of Mormon. A lot of issues, but let's say issues surrounding Book of Mormon historicity mm-hmm. since I was a teenager. Um, one of the things that I studied extensively when I got home from my mission was the argument, the criticisms of the Book of Mormon and possible responses. And not only did I familiarize myself with the... Uh, responses that other people had published, I, like, basically developed some of my own, you know, I didn't publish them, but I came up with my own explanations for some things. I just, at this point in my journey, I, I didn't, I wasn't at all satisfied with the answers that I had. How familiar were you with the research that Farms was doing? You know, I, I had, um, I'd explored them uh, a good bit. I mean, I, you know, I hadn't, it's not like I'd read everything that they published, but I was, I was pretty familiar with the apologetic arguments. And I was pretty conversant with both apologetic arguments and critical arguments. But where, where I was at that point in things that I had found in my own research that bothered me, you know, mm-hmm. um, and um, sort of where I was, um, my overall paradigm for looking, for weighing the evidence was such that um, the I didn't find the apologetic arguments persuasive. Now, I did, in fairness, um, all the way around, I, I did acknowledge that there was evidence in favor of the Book of Mormon uh, and the church being true, I never felt like it was a question, a matter of there's all this evidence on one side and no evidence on the other side. I felt like there was evidence on both sides. At that point, what I was perceiving was that there was more evidence on the against side. And um, I I thought that some of the apologetic arguments were ad hoc, um, you know, sort of created just to deal with a specific difficulty um, and um, you know my my overall paradigm has changed so much that the way that I would weigh a lot of those things would be very different um, fact, so when probably we, when we talk about like for instance maybe later if we get to um, which I'd like to like my how my research in the last few years has changed my understanding of revelation and how it works, then like that might make more sense of how I dealt with, say, some of the Book of Mormon issues. Like My, my specific issue with the Book of Mormon was that um, it seemed like there were some... It wasn't just that it was using the King James text, but it was um, that maybe it was incorporating some of the flaws of the King James text which um, is something that now, like I said, I would see differently, but at the time that seemed to me very persuasive. Well, obviously it shouldn't include those, and so this weighs against it. You know, it looks like it's not what it purports to be. Right, the idea that if, if um, you know, this is authentic, that uh, the uh, original language of Isaiah should have come through in the Book of Mormon. Right. Right, that it should have been um, more strictly following some sort of brass plates version of Isaiah and just like completely leaving out anything from the King James that wasn't perfect. Right. So uh, you successfully navigated an exit from the church, and um, 
it, it sounds like this wasn't a protracted battle between you and the bishop and the stake president. No. Um, actually, um, fairly unfriendly terms, I suppose. They, they, although they, they were, were very, sad. they were very kind. It was it was friendly, um, and they, you know, they just went ahead and they processed the papers and. Several weeks later, I received a letter telling me that I was no longer a member of the church. Um, I don't know for sure exactly what I expected that to feel like, but whatever I expected, that's not how it felt. <laughs> um, I think I thought I would feel free, you know. And what I actually felt was like cut off, like isolated. Um, and I mentioned earlier how when I was a kid, I... And it was in the South Bend, Indiana ward, and it was really like a family, you know. That was, um, when I heard the term community, you know, used to describe like a close-knit group of people where people care about each other, that's what I think of. I think of the old South Bend ward, you know, and there were numerous, not only the other kids, but there were numerous adults in my life through the ward who cared about me and I had connections across generations you know with elderly people and and so on there was a real community there and I when I got this letter and realized like I, I wasn't part of this thing anymore this larger community um it it was actually like a hard blow you know and I also thought about my baptism when I was eight and how when I got baptized, I was making, I knew that, you know, yes, I'd made the argument in my letter that I couldn't have given informed consent at eight or whatever, but I remember being baptized, and I remember the interviews, you know, the interview with the bishop for my baptism and everything, and I, I knew that in being baptized, I was making a decision to do good and to follow Christ's example. And so I just suddenly felt baffled. Why would I have wanted to undo that, you know? Um, but I thought, ended up thinking, well, there's no, there's no going back now. Because, you know, if you're in the church and you're a doubter where you've stopped believing, you can still stay in the church, you know? The church doesn't kick people out for doubting or for not believing. But if you leave... If you resign your membership from the church, you can't, it's not simple anymore. You know, you, yes, you can come back, but you can only come back if you start believing again. And so since I didn't believe at all, I, um, and, and thought that I never could believe again, I thought that was it. You know, even if I wasn't terribly fond of the decision that I'd made, you know, didn't matter because there, there was no going back. Yeah. Well, and I mean, let's be clear though too that uh, if somebody does, if, if somebody's excommunicated, you know, if it's, I, I guess, if it's something for you know, something other than apostasy, you know, the idea is is that this is potentially a first step back into um, full fellowship in the church. Um, so when somebody writes a letter of recognition, resignation saying, I don't believe what you people believe, um, you know, that may make it a little more um, uncomfortable to, <laughs> to, to, to fellowship with those people. Um, you know, and I guess, you know, going back to the, the idea of, you know, polite conversation, you know, you, you, you tell somebody that, you know, I, I utterly disbelieve what you believe, um, that can feel like a, the potential for a fight, right? right? You know, and you don't you don't want to get in a fight with somebody. And so it, it can also, I think, make someone who is in a position who could be able to fellowship someone back into the church feel like, I, I better not even talk to that person because we might get in a fight, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that partly that might be going on where, where people, you know, you hear a lot, people who've left the church saying, that you know they've cut me off, you know, and that they mm -hmm. shun you, and mm -hmm. and um, you know there literally is no shunning that right. that takes place in the sense that you know maybe in other faith communities that that happens, but um, but the dynamics of it you know can feel like it has the same kind of effect, I suppose. Yeah. 
And so what, what did you do um, from, from that point on um, in terms of, of the church? How did you, you were still living in Utah? I was living in Utah Valley, which is very, very Mormon. Right. You know. And so how did you relate to other people in Utah Valley, which is, you know, about 90% Mormon? Right. Um, I didn't, I didn't bandy around my ex-Mormon status, you know, in general. I, um, I did, um, talk to, I, I did, this was the period when I was really involved with like ex-Mormon social events and so on. Um, but, um, I didn't. I didn't often get into arguments with you just avoid, believers, except avoid for talking about on religion. the internet. On the okay. internet, yes, very much. Um, on the fair boards, and then um, their su- successors to those boards and other other online boards. Um, Ex Mormon board recovery from Mormonism. Uh, you know, I I hated that place even then. <laughs> I it's a cesspool. I. Um, you know, there's there are all these really profane threads. You know, where people people sometimes often people who are leaving the church they they just think it's funny to mock things that they formerly held sacred, and so there's a lot of temple content that's used inappropriately. They, they think it's funny maybe just to pair the... If you say something that pairs the name of a general authority with a, with a cuss word, that's just drop-dead funny for right. this crowd, you know. Um, I would say th- ridiculous things like that Joseph Smith was a pedophile and things like that. And, and, you know, it's not like I was a big Joseph Smith fan at the time, right? I left the church because, in good measure, because I was completely alienated from Joseph Smith, and I thought he was an opportunist, you know. But I still found some of the things that they said about him absolutely absurd, you know. I I wasn't, um, it, yeah, they just were saying absurd things. And so you didn't really go on the war path against the church at any time? N- no. Now, I did anticipate at that point that when I eventually published that it would have... Um, a kind of that it would have a damaging effect and did did you make any attempts at leading other people out of the church during this time period um, i don't think i directly i don't think i intended intentionally tried to lead people out i i had it was something that I was very conflicted over because um, I didn't think that the church was true. Um, and, you know, I was an atheist, I was a humanist, and so I thought that uh, it would be better to, for people to um, put their efforts elsewhere than in a religious organization like this. Um, but I also... Why I was torn was because I knew the pain that I had gone through in losing my faith, and it wasn't something that I was eager to inflict on other people. I thought that ultimately my work might have that effect. You know, if I were publishing things with the laying out the perceptions that I had at the time of Joseph Smith and early Mormon history. Um, but, um, my experience growing up in the church, you know, there's, there's some people who leave the church and they just have all these complaints about, you know, like, oh, how horrible it was growing up LDS and everything. My growing up in the church was absolutely wonderful. It was wonderful. And, um, you know, I still had some very fond feelings toward the church, while at the same time completely disbelieving and, belie- and thinking that it was built on these lies, you know. And um, so when I, it was during this period when I read the book The End of Faith uh, by Sam Harris, and for those who aren't familiar with it, what it argues is that 
in the age of weapons of mass destruction, religion is uh, an illusion that we can no longer afford because it will ultimately lead some nutty religious people to use nuclear weapons or whatever, you know, and we'll all get wiped out. Um, well, he's, he's an excellent writer. A few writers that I envy, I envy Sam Harris's writing. Um, it was very persuasive. And it was something that I was kind of primed to hear because I felt like I had real evidence against the church being true. Um, but I felt terrible about the idea that letting it out was going to damage this good organization and put other people through a faith crisis. Um, but Sam Harris's argument would, if it were true, would mean that what I was doing, what I would be doing in publishing in that vein, would be like good. It would be helping to save the world, right? And so I was really primed to hear that, you know, and so I, I embraced his book with the vengeance and he has he thinks that part of the way that we're going to overcome religion is by mocking it. <laughs> and so probably on the whole, even in my online participation in online discussion, I was usually a um fairly um reasonably polite discussant. Um during this period I think is when I made my greatest forays into being obnoxious. Um, just because I was influenced by Sam Harris's book and his arguments. So you'd raise those points. I mean, you'd, you'd do it in a, you know, a non-vulgar, you know, um, obnoxious way, but you'd say, hey, guys, you know, look, religion is bad for the world. So, you know, that's, that, well, I guess that's kind of the extent of your aggressive response to, to, to people who are I, religious. I, was, I became, I think... Mostly, pretty much just for a short period of time, I became more dismissive and just kind of less willing to engage with the arguments that believers would make. You'd just be like, bah, you know. Um, but um, and, and you felt that you were morally justified because of what Sam Harris was saying. Right. Having accepted his arguments, I felt like uh, this this was a good thing mm -hmm. for me to be doing. Um, it was not a belief that I could sustain for very long. Um, I started becoming increasingly aware of, I, I had some awareness of these already, but I started becoming increasingly aware of studies um, that discuss, studies on religion and its effect on people, on their health, on their happiness, on family stability, uh, on their good behavior, you know, and, um, and particularly studies that related to the church. And I became, you know, at first I kind of resisted. I thought, well, this study could be biased in this way, or what is the methodology good on this one, you know. And then um, as the evidence that I was aware of started to accumulate, I, I kind of said to myself, look, you know, you've left, um, you stopped believing in the church and left the church because you, you know, think that the evidence points against it. Are you now going to reject the evidence when it's saying that this is good for people? And, you know, it wouldn't have made any sense to me to to do that. And so I, I started to re-embrace the idea that religion was good, um, that the church was really good, uh, like it had been in my own experience. Um, I also encountered some really, really good people who I think epitomize um, the kind of, you know, wonderful people that the church produces. And that... Um, that started, that was really probably my first step toward coming back was just recognizing the goodness 
that was there and fully acknowledging that to myself. As religion can motivate people to do some really bad things, you know, fly into buildings, religion can also motivate people to the same extreme on other ends, to sacrifice right. themselves for the good of others. Right. And, and right. so I guess you started to, to recognize that. And so, so you move from this position of religion is an evil in the world to religion you know, is a potentially good force. So, so I had always recognized that religion had a lot of good to it, but I had thought, particularly using Sam Harris's arguments and some other things, I had thought that religion was a net negative, you know, that on balance it was bad for the world and dangerous. Um, the more I looked into the matter, the more convinced I was that, well, yes, you know, there are religious extremists. Religion can have downsides. Um, on balance, actually, religion is such a force for good in the world, and the church is such an overwhelming force for good in the world. You know, for every, for every person who does a suicide bombing, uh, there are tens, there are hundreds of thousands or more, well, no, there are many millions of people who are more giving and, you know, serve other people more because of their religious faith. So to look at the these people who do the crazy evil things is to look at the exceptions rather than the rule and say we should judge religion based on the exceptions. No, we should judge religion based on the rule. You know, you look at how does religion mostly affect people? What's the overwhelming effect that it has on people? And the effects are so positive. And that's, like I said, that's not something that at the time I really wanted to hear, you know. But I felt like just if I were going to be honest with myself, it was a conclusion that I had to accept. The second step in my return to faith was uh, coming to believe in God again. And that uh, came about in, uh, well, you know, like, like all good stories of return to faith in God, it began with reading Skeptic Magazine, you know. Um, Skeptic Magazine, it's edited by Michael Shermer. He's um, really kind of a noted enemy of the supernatural, supernatural claims. And that's really what the magazine focuses on. Um, so I was... Uh, I was a good little atheist, you know, I was reading, uh, reading Skeptic, um, and I came across an ad for a book. Uh, the book was called Biocosm, and um, it was by the author James Gardner. Biocosm, it, you know, it, according to the ad, it would explain how the universe could have a meaning without any appeal to the supernatural. And the editor of Skeptic was one of the people who was endorsing the book in the ad. And I just wondered, what on earth could this book be saying? You know, I got my curiosity. And even while I'd been an atheist, while I had, not, I had no belief in the supernatural during that time, um, in anything supernatural, I had still wanted some... I'd wanted... Some there to be some larger meaning to things, you know. I felt like I could have meaning in my life in the sense that certain things I regard as meaningful, you know, helping other people, loving my family members, you know, these are meaningful to me. But I didn't think there was any larger purpose. I, I wanted that, you know. I had been a spiritual kid that was like part of spirituality, concern for spiritual questions, it's part of who I am. From the time I was little, I have thought a lot about meaning, you know, I wanted to live meaningfully, I wanted there to be a meaning to things that I did and experienced. And, uh, you know, I, even when I was like 11 years old, I wanted to, um, I wanted to have kids. I, I realized that I, I made not just not, 
I knew that I wanted to have kids, not just in the way that little kids think they want to have kids, because they, it's the thing that grown-ups do. I decided consciously that I wanted to have children because I knew that eventually I wouldn't be here in the world, and I wanted a legacy. I wanted some meaning to outlive me. So um, I was very much primed for this book, you know, I, I, I was very curious, and so I went and I checked it out, um, and the author argues, um, he's, he's, his overall argument is he's arguing that um, the universe, the reason that the universe is geared for life, for the existence of life, is that the universe was designed by like a super advanced civilization. So here's how he has somebody filling the God role, right, well, without uh, being God. Well, yeah, so let's back up a minute. So this goes up to what's called the anthropic principle, which is that there are all of these calculations that we can make in physics that are so finely tuned that, you know, if you just vary, if they vary by a slight degree, so, you know, gravity um, or you know, the relationship between the sun and the, the earth and, you know, all of these different types of, uh, of uh, things we find in nature, if they, do, if they change just a little bit, humans cannot exist. Right. And so um, some people point to that as evidence of um, uh, design, that, that, that um, you know, a supernatural being or God must have designed this right. so that his children could live. And so here we have an atheist who's trying to explain right. the anthropic principle. And so right. what did he say? So, um, first of all, so I was familiar with the anthropic principle and it's being used as an argument for the existence of God, you know. Um, but I thought I had explanations for it. First of all, I thought when they talked about fine-tuning, I thought they were saying like there's like a one in a billion chance of the universe having the constants, the the fundamental laws, you know, that allow the existence of any kind of life. Um, he showed um, that the best estimate that's been um, made by Sir Martin Rees, who's the uh, Britain's astronomer royal, um, one of the discoverers of the, the creators of the theories about black holes. Um, Sir Martin Rees wrote a book called Just Six Numbers in which he uh, goes through the different constants of the universe that need to be the way they are for life to exist. And he estimates that the chances of the universe being fit for life are 1 in 10 to the 200th power. You know, 10 in the 200th power. I mean, so I was thinking like 10 to the 9th billion. 10 to the 200th, you know, is so phenomenally larger than that that, you know, it makes a billion look like zero. So it's a number that's so large that the thing that I really understand about it is that it's too big for me to understand. Um, in fact, it's, it's far more than the number of particles that there are in the entire universe from what physicists estimate. Um, what they estimate is, I don't remember the exact number, but it's well under 10 to the 100th power. So imagine that there was a universe, a uh, full universe like ours, and that that universe was actually a particle in a larger universe, also the same, you know, same scale as ours, with as many stars and galaxies and particles and so on. And then imagine that you were playing the lottery by picking a single particle out of the entire larger universe there, and then picking within that universe another particle, and you happen to pick the two exact right particles to win the lottery. Well, that's what we've done. We're he here. Those are the kinds of odds, and it's actually even less likely than that because the number of particles in the universe is less than 10 to the, 200th, 10 to the 100th power. You know? So we've won the cosmic lottery. So um, that blew me away. I kept reading, very interested now, you know. And uh, the author 
then proceeded to demolish uh, my explanation for the fine-tuning, which I'd gotten from... Um, I'm thinking of another, I'm thinking of the wrong physicist's name. Maybe it'll come to me, but uh, I think it's it's one of the guys who's been involved with the big discussions about string theory. But uh, Brian Green? No, it's not him. And I was thinking Susskind, but it's not him. I may, like I said, maybe it'll maybe it'll come to me. But he has this like idea of baby universes that. Um, maybe black holes are baby universes, so maybe the universe really isn't fine-tuned to the production of life. It's fine-tuned for the production of black holes. And therefore, a universe that has the greatest number of black holes has the greatest number of baby universes. So it's like a natural selection. The universe that has the most children, you know, then it, it, it will pass on something to its children so that that universe will have even more children and so the predominant kind of universe that's out there in the multiverse will be a universe that uh, is fine-tuned for the production of black holes, has the maximum number of black holes. Well, the author of this book, James Gardner, uh, made arguments that uh, actually our universe is not fine-tuned for the production of black holes. It, it doesn't, it could produce even more, you know, if, if the constants of the universe were different. And uh, and he brings in the most unlikely ally of all in his argument, Richard Dawkins. It turns out that Richard Dawkins had done uh, a critique of this arg- baby universe's argument. He didn't completely reject it, but he argued, you know, there are five things that we need to have a selective process work, and that uh, this physicist could demonstrate two of them. So, for instance, um, for for so a selection process to work, there would have to be something like DNA. The baby universe would have to have some, thing, some sort of DNA, so to speak, to make its laws like those of the parent universe. But they would have to not be exactly like those of the parent universe because there would have to be little mutations so they could be just different enough so that it could evolve in the direction of having more and more black holes, you know. Um, so, anyway, the the author did a good job of deep sixing my explanation for the fine tuning. So here's what he had done: he made the fine tuning infinitely, almost immeasurably greater than what I could have imagined, and then he took away my explanation for it. So. I was dying to see his explanation. Well, when I got to his explanation, he believes that um, the universe that we're in was fine-tuned by our distant descendants. Not ancestors, descendants. That someday, like our successors in the universe, will become so powerful that they'll be able to engineer it so that when it collapses, it will restart, you know, it's a big crunch and this big bang where the new universe will have just the right constants to produce life, but he believes that time is a closed loop so that at the end of the universe it actually goes back to the beginning of the universe. So literally it's our descendant our descendants are our distant descendants are our creators. Well you know um I read and I thought, he thinks this is more likely than God, you know? I I had come to believe that there was no God, but I'd never, you know, like questioned whether the future could become the past or the past the future or something, you know? I mean, uh, whether events in the future could cause events that proceeded earlier, you know? Um, it just didn't make any, it didn't work for me at all. And so I started considering other evidence that had been there all along, but that I'd been ignoring, that there was a mind behind the universe, that it didn't just happen. The universe has a kind of rational architecture to it. You know, as, as Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And uh, so if there was a mind or something very much like a mind behind the universe, then like that was God 
you know, so I became, I became a deist. I didn't, uh, I just thought there was like a creative mind. I didn't immediately think that there was a God who was involved in our day-to-day lives or anything like that. But this broke everything open. You know, the, I, I mentioned earlier how I'd become really more closed in my views and closed in what I would consider and that that ended. I became much more open and started exploring areas that I thought I wouldn't go back to again. And I revisited that experience that I had when I was 18 and crossing the street uh, in downtown Salt Lake, you know, where I was warned of an oncoming car. I happened to be working in Salt Lake at the time and walking to work downtown, so I passed that spot every day. And... Um, as I did, I sometimes went to the spot and I tried to think, okay, here was where the car was, here was the trajectory of the car, here was where I was. And I would try to, you know, I was trying to figure out, could I really have known what was going to happen with that car without some sort of outside help? And I, I realized some things about the experience that um, have me completely convinced that I, I could not unless I have supernatural powers myself, I could not have known what was going to happen. I, the warning had to have come from outside of me. And so I began believing again that God is, not only is there a God, but God cares about us. God is involved in our lives. So from that, you started to entertain the idea that some kind of religious belief made rational sense. Yeah. So uh, I was left with this giant question. So it was like, okay, so there's a God, but what does God want me to do? You know, what, what's this all about? So once you determined that God does care about us and is involved in what we're doing, what was the next step on your progression? The next step was I I really wasn't sure that any of the I'd looked into religions a lot before and I thought maybe they're I, I tried I considered could one of these religions really have been given by God and be like the right one? Uh and I thought maybe not. I thought maybe there wasn't some one religion that was like God's religion. Um, even though I believe there was a God. And so I thought, well, maybe the best that we can do is, maybe the best I can do is to try to best approximate what God would want me to do by looking and finding something in the various religious visions that are out there that's really inspiring to me, that's expansive, that's beautiful. You know, I had believed that I had closed the door permanently on Mormonism, so I didn't go there, you know. Um, and I ended up um, getting involved with the Baha'i faith. I don't know if you know yeah. much about them. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know much about them, but I, I did know a person who was uh, part of the Baha'i faith. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a really, really expansive faith. They affirm that all the founders of the great religious traditions in the world were sent by God, were prophets, but with messages for their particular age and place, you know. Dispensation, um, as it were. <laughs> well, they they use the term dispensation. Really? Yeah, they do. And, in fact, there's there's a lot that's very similar. They believe in eternal marriage, for instance. They don't believe it requires a special ceremony. But they believe that... Uh, a, Righteous, two righteous people are married to each other, continue to be married in the eternities. They continue together. Um, and it may, that may have been part of why it appealed to me, too, is that it had some things, some of the, some of the good and beautiful things that I had grown up with as a Latter-day Saint. You know, um, There's not a concept of like an eternal flaming hell or anything awful like that, you know. Um, just their their main principles, what they call the oneness of humankind, um, 
just really focusing on how we are all God's children and what, it's like they envision a sort of global Zion where we all become of one heart and one mind. And this, I thought, this is the sort of message that the world needs and this would really help me to be the kind of person that I want to be, you know. And uh, I wasn't believing it literally at that point. It was more, you know, pragmatic attachment. But as I, I, I became a Baha'i, I... Um, this doesn't require any ceremony. You just sign a declar card declaring that you believe certain things. And I, I came to believe enough, not, not necessarily really strongly that the founder was literally sent by God, but you know, I was sort of willing to take that belief on provisionally. You know, um, that was really seemed to be going well um, after. Just a couple of months, I um, I found that I was trying to kind of be a Baha'i in a Mormon way. Maybe <laughs> one of the one of the few Baha'i beliefs that left me very puzzled was that they believed that the founding figures of the faith were infa- were infallible. Well, you know, growing up LDS, the idea of anybody being infallible just makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And I think just logically, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I really. So did they did they apply that to Mormonism as well? I mean, was there was there any discussion? And I mean, maybe in Utah Baha'i they do talk about Joseph Smith and oh yeah. And would they have said that Joseph Smith was infallible? One, no, they wouldn't have. But the the infallibility they only impute to certain major prophets. Okay, so Muhammad and, and Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, Jesus. Okay. Um, um, Zoroaster. The, yeah, their founder, Baha'u'llah, um, and um, his son, who sort of succeeded him, and then his his grandson. Those are the three founding, they call them the founding figures of the faith. Well, the, the founder's great-grandson, Shoghi Effendi, said one time that Joseph Smith, he ca- said he was not a prophet, but he called him a seer, which I think in their usage, those terms mean something different than what they mean to us. But it did affirm, he did affirm that Joseph Smith was inspired in some way. Maybe sort of a bodhisattva so, type of a figure. Yeah, somebody good, somebody okay. whom God used. All right. Um, so um, I, I remember thinking, but isn't a prophet just a prophet when he's acting as such, you know? Um, Instead of making everything that these founding figures said infallible, I wanted to believe that sometimes they were inspired and sometimes they were just people. Um, and also, you know, the Baha'i faith, well, its law code is probably lax compared to other faiths. This was another unusual thing to me, is that it, it does have a law code, and so it spells out some things that seem arbitrary, like... Um, when you die, you're not supposed to be buried more than, I can't remember if it's like 95 or 50 miles from the place that you die. I don't know, it doesn't, I don't know what the meaning of that's supposed to be. There's nothing that's explained, you know. But if I die when I'm off on a trip overseas or something, I don't want my family to never be able to come to my grave, you know, unless they make a pilgrimage. So it was sort of a deal breaker for you. <laughs> well, well, it wasn't a deal breaker, but it was something that made me, but I didn't plan on doing that. That just didn't make sense to me. You're a cafeteria you know? behind member. <laughs> I, I was, yeah. And it kind of overlaying a, a Mormon paradigm onto some of those beliefs. I, I was overlaying a Mormon paradigm because I thought, the prophet was only a prophet when he was acting as such. Um, and I thought that, um, you know, there are complaints from some other Christians, like evangelicals and others, that Mormonism is legalistic. Well, come on. They don't know. They say that because they've never experienced a faith that has a law code. The faiths that are legalistic are the faiths that have actual law codes. And the Baha'i faith really isn't bad in that way, you know. It's not one of the more strict ones by any by any means, but 
you know, if they think Mormonism is legalistic, they should actually experience a faith that actually really has a law code like that, you know. Um, so what I what I thought was, I remember thinking that something like Mormonism would be more ideal in this way, where Mormons, certainly Mormons have rules to live by, commandments, but they're not like this detailed law code that just seems arbitrary. Most, most of the commandments have to do with being good rather than things that seem like, why are we doing this again, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, I, you know, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier was that when, when, I, was, uh, when I was an atheist, I had, uh, and had started really believing that religion was good, I, I became particularly impressed with how good Mormons were. And my friend Brian Hales was a great example of that, of the kind of good people the church produces, a um, girl who works at the church historical department, Brittany Chapman, was another, just absolutely fantastic people. And I remember thinking, you know, maybe these Mormons have something, you know, maybe I should kind of live more like Mormons do. And uh, not that I was ever, like, completely wild off the deep end, but I wasn't, you know, keeping LDS standards across the board. Um so I had shifted my life somewhat to be more LDS. And then, uh, so when I was an atheist, I had tried to be kind of more like a Mormon. And when I was a Baha'i, I was trying to be kind of more like a Mormon, you know. Um, then something horrendous happened. Um, when I'd just been a Baha'i a couple of months, uh, my youngest brother Charles passed away just suddenly out of the blue. You know, uh, there was no warning that this was going to happen. There's actually not even, in spite of an autopsy and a toxicology, there's not, there's no official cause of death. You know, we think it was related to prescriptions that he was on, um, but that didn't show up, you know. So just, I talked to him one night and the next day he was gone. He was 25, you know. Well, my beliefs about the afterlife at this point had still been pretty amorphous and indefinite. You know, the the Baha'is definitely believe in an afterlife, but it's conceived of, they don't talk about it a whole lot, and it's conceived of as completely mental, like, not like we have spirit bodies, but just like we're just Your consciousness continues. Right. Okay. I have no, I, I have no way of visualizing or really understanding what that would be like. You know, and so it was a difficult thing for me to wrap my mind around. Um, when I was there at uh, Charles's viewing, you know, I thought that I was looking at his, looking at him, for the last time. Uh, I thought I would probably encounter his consciousness somehow, but you know, in this life, we don't just know each other as disembodied souls or something. We know each other as full human beings, you know, by partly by you know, tone of voice and appearance and characteristic mannerisms, you know, things we do. And you know, looking at Charles's body there, I thought I'm never going to experience any of that. <clears throat> I was never going to experience any of that again, um, from what I understood. And you know, it was. It was wrenching. It was awful. Um, I had assumed that probably there was no faith that could really claim the kind of level of truth that that really had the kind of, the level of truth that they all claimed, right? Like God really revealed this very directly. He told a prophet this, and this is how it is, you know. Um, and so I had gone with something that was wonderful and beautiful, um, and that I could believe that God was probably in, somehow had his hand in. Um, but Charles's death really opened up the question for me again, is there something where God has revealed what this is all about, 
you know, and his will. And, and I became really, I really wanted to look more into the idea of resurrection, you know, which you don't have in the Baha'i faith and a number of faiths, most faiths in the world. Um, but you do have, you know, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, and um, so I, I really studied um, about the resurrection of Christ. A friend, um, a non-LDS Christian friend, uh, gave me a copy of N.T. Wright's book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's this, have you seen it? It's this magisterial tome of several hundred pages where he goes through all of the texts in the New Testament that relate to the resurrection. And he does really, I mean, he's, he's the real deal as far as a biblical scholar goes, and he gives you know, really in-depth analyses and tries to figure out what happened. So he's laying out uh, the arguments that Christ was resurrected. What, what he's doing is he, he draws a conclusion at, along those lines at the end, but really what he's doing in the body of the book is he's asking what do these texts tell us about whatever the event was, the resurrection event was, that what was it that happened that made the early Christians believe that Jesus was resurrected. And he, he concludes from that data that there, there are two things that have to have been in place. For one thing, they have to have seen, you know, had a vision or whatever. They had to have seen Christ again. And the tomb had to be empty. Um, and he argues that if those two things are the case, then he makes some argument at at the end of the book for, you know, why it's reasonable then to believe that Christ actually was resurrected. Um, I, I was compelled by it, and I came to believe again in Christ um, as God's Son, you know, as divine, and in his resurrection. And um, this actually even though in some ways it was drawing me closer to the church, it, in some ways it s- sort of pulled me away because I, I didn't think I could be LDS, right? But I'd, I'd gone into the Baha'i faith, which really affirmed Mormonism was good, you know. Uh, God had a hand in it. But I ended up becoming like a more traditional Christian, a non-LDS Christian, I wasn't, I didn't align with the denomination or something, um, but since I wasn't LDS, I thought, I, I don't know, I had some questions in my mind about, was Mormonism fully Christian? Was it fully okay? You know, because it's so different on certain points. And because I still was disenchanted with Joseph Smith, you know. Um, and... Um, I was really kind of trying to find a model for what sort of Christian I would be. You know, the Bible, I recognize, the Bible's not self-interpreting. The Bible doesn't give you the lens for reading the Bible. And thus we have so many different Christian traditions. Right. You get your lens from whatever Christian denomination, from whatever tradition you adhere to. So Protestants understand the text, and liberal Protestants understand it differently than evangelicals, understand it differently than Catholics, understand it differently from Orthodox, you know, and so on. Um, So I had chosen like a sort of loosely Protestant model at first for how I was going to interpret the Bible. Um, And I was actively reading my New Testament. I prayed, you know, I tried to live a Christian life, and I had actually a really powerful spiritual experience when I first started to believe in Christ again, where I felt such an overwhelming peace. It was astonishing. It, um, it what, just, what brought it about? What was the catalyst? Of that that of that experience, it right? It was thinking about God, um, 
sort of manifesting himself to the world through his son and that he was reaching out to us to have a relationship with us. So and really you're it, kind of contemplating how God has blessed us through his son and, and you felt a powerful right, spiritual that, confirmation that he, right, of that. And that he was reaching out to us for a relationship and I, yeah, I felt such an overwhelming peace and it came more than once. Um, and I, what I thought of was Paul's phrase in the New Testament when he refers to the peace that path, passeth understanding. Because that's, that's what it felt like. Um, but um, I, as I was practicing, you know, as I was practicing my devotion um, to Christ, I, I started realizing that this was so incredibly familiar, like, you know, I've been here before, you know, and I, I remembered earlier in my life when I'd been a very devout Latter-day Saint and really re- actively reading the Book of Mormon in order to draw closer to Christ. And I remembered how powerful a tool that had been for me uh, in that, and I thought, I'll try it, you know. So you had a desire to come closer to Christ. Right. And, and that I, led you back to the and Book I thought, of Mormon. Right, and I thought, in this book, whatever its origins are, and I still held to the same view of its origins that I had held. You know, I thought it was written by Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith was an opportunist, you know. I wasn't sure how he had managed to write such an amazing book, you know. I thought partly he must have been drawing on the beliefs of people around him or something, their profound spirituality, and sort of channeling it into this book. But whatever its origins, practically in my life, this had worked, and it did again. I started reading, and it really, my sense of drawing close to Christ grew greatly. And so um, I started kind of expanding that more. I read... I read a little more LDS literature about spirituality, prayer, and such. And I basically started using a Mormon lens for reading the Bible, understanding Christianity, even though I didn't believe the founding historical and theological claims of Mormonism. Well, not too surprisingly, then I got really, really confused (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right because it just logically it didn't seem to make any sense that here I was using in order to get closer to Christ I was using something that in the Mormon version of Christianity in some ways just seemed like the best one you know it seemed to work the best and it seemed the most true to the biblical text you know like Evangelical Christians will say, you know, you just believe in Christ and you're saved. But, you know, you read like the Gospel of Matthew and well, that's not what I see him saying, you know. Um, your belief has to include true discipleship, you know. Yeah, if you it's, love me, keep my commandments. Right, right. And... Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, you know, goes into his kingdom, but those who do his will. And that seems so much more Mormon to me than it is Protestant. Thank you for listening to the Mormon Faircast. If there is an issue that you've been wondering about, you can often find the latest answers at the Fair Wiki, found at fairmormon.org. If you can't find your answer there, feel free to pose your question to the Fair Apologists by visiting the Fair Contact page. Questions or comments about this episode can be sent to podcast at fairlds.org or join the conversation at fairblog.org. Tell your friends about us and help increase the popularity of this podcast by subscribing in iTunes and by writing a review. Music for this episode was provided courtesy of Paul Cardall. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or of FAIR.